I figured I'd do another video where I talk to my McDonald's drive through quality microphone about esoteric children's entertainment, you, you know, to mix things up. A little while ago, I was jonesing for a game that lets you recruit enemies. It's one of my absolute favorite gimmicks in video games. Using something against enemies that was once used against you allows you for a better understanding of the kind of unpleasantness you're inflicting. It's like how American cops tase each other, so they understand the power they wield, and also because it makes for amazing content. First, I'd tried a Pokemon fan game called Pokemon Insurgents. It was very competently made, but it was still Pokemon, which I cannot bring myself to enjoy anymore. They're just too simple. I could easily play four Pokemons at once, one on each limb. I'd probably pull off a fifth with my schnaz. These days, I require a certain level of complexity in my video games to adequately drown out the existential dread. I want to mention, the Pokemon fan game had a Modern Warfare 2 style disclaimer. It warned the game contained objectionable content and then you had the option to remove it. They specifically said at some point Pokemon fused with people, and I like to imagine that someone gets sucked into a whooper and it's played super straight like a serious crime against humanity has occurred. Anyway, after I saw an image of SMT Nocturne and realized it was Persona, but you get three Personas, I was kind of sold. I'm a massive sucker for the modern occultism stuff in the Persona games. Mixing that with a Pokemon-like creature collector sounded right up my alley. And it was. I deeply enjoyed it. However, I'm not sure if I'd recommend them to most people. The game presents a lot of somewhat complex mechanics for the player, and it expects you to learn and apply them while also trying to casual filter you every few hours. Take some patience to figure things out, uh, more patience than I think a lot of people have for video games these days. Though if you do stick with the game, it is a very rewarding experience. You start out as a high schooler in a Tokyo subway, going to meet your teacher and some classmates at an abandoned hospital. On your way there, people are gossiping about how a protest against the construction of a new communications tower turned deadly. Uh oh. <laughs> I up of the company involved with the tower has gone missing and some fedora lord in the park implies the entire incident is related to some local cult activity. Once you make it to the hospital, meet up with your friends, one of which is wearing exclusively denim. Yes, you look at your teacher who is hanging out with the missing tech CEO guy in the basement of the hospital. Turns out the incident was cult related, and the right narrative was a cover up, and the world ends. It was from Scooby Doo to really quick. It explained that the world had reached a point of stagnation, and collapsed under the weight of its own sin and dissipating power. With the help of whatever nonsense the tech CEO guy had been up to, a little boy drops a bug into your POV hole, which gives you a full body bioluminescent tattoo. And Tokyo is turned into a vortex world, which is a transitionary period between the old now dead world and a new one that's yet to be made. It looks a lot like a hollow earth rock garden with a talking sun in the middle, dotted with abandoned buildings, mostly shopping malls which are filled with demons. Not like fallen angel bible demons, but uh, actually yes, act those. But also, every other religious or mythical character or creature, including bible angels, are walking around and referred to as demons. From what my slug brain can surmise, we're using demons in the yokai sense, where they're spirits born from human emotions, beliefs, and philosophies. Religious figures like angels, demons, and Thor manifest from the collective fates of the old world, and they embody the ideals of the groups that birthed them. So Thor is a brutal jerk, like you'd expect Vikings to be, but also, if you're a brutal jerk, he shows you some level of respect. Also, kind of how Vikings are portrayed as noble, sometimes. And you got Jack Frost, who appears to be a mascot in the previous world? I guess the collective awareness of his existence as a mascot makes him manifest as a demon in the Vortex world. I want to point out, this means a certain someone's dimensional merge prophecy comes true in Nocturne, and you'd see fictitious characters running around if this were to happen in real life. Hell, probably anyone relevant enough to get a Wikipedia page might manifest as a demon in the Vortex world. It wouldn't really be the person itself a living caricature based off of the collective consciousness's perception of them. You could also interpret demons as beings that exist outside what we understand as reality, but find ways to manifest in it through influencing humans. So when a bunch of Scandinavian men get cold enough, knowledge of Thor consistently manifests among their thoughts, which makes them start acting like Vikings, and the emotional energy expelled from the Viking activities powers Thor. He then uses power during one of these transitionary vortex world states to manifest physically, and try to bring about a new world that he'd have an easier time influencing, so one filled with very cold Scandinavians. 
Worlds with lots of promiscuity would be favorable to the succubi-like demons. I mean, drinking and driving would be favorable to Dionysus and that guy who looks like a mix between the Istanbul music video and the fad freak or Sir Ned Ed Netty. This second interpretation would mean most, if not all, cartoon characters are demons that have manifested in our world using showrunners and cartoonists as an entry point. Later, mass media is a way to spread their influence and gain additional power from the emotional reactions and attachments they create. The writers may have intended something close to one or a combination of my interpretations of what Nocturne Demons are supposed to be, or I may have missed an in-game explanation because I'm not good at reading, I'm just projecting some kind of undiagnosed mental illness onto a digital board game. Don't know if it needs to be said, but the demons in the SMT series look amazing. The designs and general style get across this vibe that's both mystic and alien. It's perfect for depicting mythology and biblical imagery. Hiring the Thin Man from XCOM to do your art really pays off in the end. As the player, it's your goal to become powerful enough to bring about the creation of a new world. You can choose one of four reasons, which are guiding philosophies or visions of how the new world should be. Tech CEO Man is already hard at work doing the typical Tech CEO Man move of conspiring with esoteric dark gods to bring about a world of domesticated men, working as cogs in a greater machine with no conflict. You can side with them, or alternatively support might makes right Senator Armstrongism, bro what if we just all left each other alone-ism, or I said no to everyone to see what happens. Ism. Um, outside of the intro, the game's very gamey. And lonely. There's the occasional ghost or demon standing around to talk to. And you should, since they give you hints on where to go next. But don't expect a gaggle of friends to banter with like Persona. Your aim is to urban explore, fight demons, recruit and staple them together into stronger demons, so you can then fight increasingly difficult bosses as they progress to weirder places to explore and stronger demons to recruit. Random battles are enabled almost everywhere, and are frequent. This is annoying at times, but you have to internalize that the battles aren't interrupting you from progressing to content. The battles are the content, and luckily the combat is fun. While I could hypothetically play five instances of Pokemon at once, Nocturne required not only my full attention, but also reclaiming and utilizing the part of my brain previously dedicated to my screaming pony orb culpa. It's turn-based GRPG fights. However, it's given depth by the press turn system. Critical hits and exploiting weaknesses will give you more moves in your team's turn. On the flip side, missing an attack or using a damage type that's voided by an enemy will waste not only the move you were just using, but an additional one after. And it gets worse! If the enemy reflects or absorbs the damage type you use, that is it. All of your moves check out and it flops to the enemy's turn. Goodbye. What's important to know is these rules work both ways, and no demon no matter how strong is immune from them. This is a good thing, since a lot of these pricks have moves that give them more moves. It feels very weird being on this side of the wishing floor wishes conundrum, but just like a genie, all it takes is for them to word one of these wishes poorly for you to get the green light to teleport them to the live leak dimension, and see them consumed by the escalator of your superior long-term planning skills. There are no Pokeballs in Nocturne. To recruit demons, you'll have to convince them verbally to join you. To do this, you have to actually employ pickup artist strategies. Demons will ask for a series of items and direct cash payments. If you say yes to all of these, they will typically call you a cringe lord and demanifest. You have to say no to some of these requests or they will not respect you. It requires approaching conversation like a total neurotic. Once you've piqued their interest though, they'll ask you a philosophical question. Like, is weakness evil? Are plants' lives more desirable than animals? Or do you want the dance? It can be hard to determine what the demon wants to hear. All you really have to go on is how they look and what they talk like. If you guess right, you got a new party member. Your main character who's always in your party, and also who you lose if dies, has a generic recruitment ability. Demons can learn special negotiation skills, similar to how attacks have damage types that are stronger or weaker, depending on the target. Negotiation skills are more or less effective depending on the target's personality. Seduce will work best when a young female demon is using it against a lughead. Just like in real life, kidnap is strong against child. Talking to demons is a very big part of the game. Outside of recruitment, there are skills to ask for items, money. Sometimes instead of attacking, enemies will just walk up to you and ask for a stick of gum. At one point in the game, I had a floating skull come up to me with a snake coming out of its eye. It asked me for some demon skittles or something, and in return, it gave me some game tips. The catch was it spoke in Shakespearean English, and I could not discern what it was trying to say at all. 
When the Thalking Sun is at its brightest, demons don't handle it super great. During this time, they have severely impaired judgment, which makes it the perfect opportunity to get them to agree to permanent life-altering decisions. If you keep asking during this time, they will eventually make a noise that sounds similar to yes. That is all it takes to become friends for life. Or at least friends until they stop being useful. <laughs> your main character will level at a pretty respectable rate. Your demons won't. When your party members become impotent, either from falling behind in levels or because the current boss you're fighting is strong against them, it's time to take them out behind the shed. And that is where the real fun begins. Fusion is the system that enables you to become stupid powerful. Your enjoyment of the game hinges largely on learning and utilizing this system, which can take some time. At a base level, you take two underlevel demons, staple them together, and you get a new one that's closer to your level, also transferring over some of the skills from the older demons. Demons created with basic fusion are a little underwhelming, mostly because they lack their unlockable skills, which tend to be their best skills. To get these unlocked, you'll have to level them, which can take hours of done through grinding. Sacrificial fusion is weird. You can use two demons to make a new one like normal, but a third demon can be sacrificed along with them. Sacrifice demons have some of their skills transferred, but most importantly, the XP they earn throughout their life is transferred over to the new demon on a 1.5 multiplier, and it gets dumber. The new demon produced can then be sacrificed instantly, and the XP they gain from the previous sacrifice is immediately transferred over to the new demon, again on a 1.5 multiplier. If this sounds confusing, it is. But once you get the hang of it, sacrificing just becomes printing XP. Hours of grinding turn into 4 seconds of impaling fairies. You can get demons to learn all their skills, then take the dumbest fringe skills off those demons, and move them over to demons that shouldn't have them. Mix this with the compendium which lets you make safe states of your demon and buy them back later. With a little bit of experimentation, you'll be making squads of unkillable gods who can fire true damage nukes for free every battle. All the SMT games I've played have their meme song. You know, the catchy earworm you hear a hundred times in your playthrough. Persona 3 has... Persona 5 has... You'll never see it come and Nocturne's no exception. If you find people talking about Nocturne or mainline SMT in general on the internet, you'll pretty often see a certain phrase spammed in all caps. It's over the top and silly, but it's very fitting. More fitting than any other SMT meme song. You know, despite how many times they say it, and how often it's said, there really are not that many babies in Persona 3. Combat in Persona 5 is turn-based, so the enemies do, in fact, see it coming. But, when you get totally thrashed by a seemingly impossible boss, spend two hours creating Frankenstein monsters made specifically to counter it, rematch, and see the previously godlike being now pathetic and unable to do anything without healing your team or hurting itself. When you see this esoteric Gachin deity trapped in a metaphorical circle of whoopee cushions, totally unable to react to you and your friends slapping to death, the feeling you get is perfectly encapsulated by it. 